broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and thank everyone so much for patiently waiting. We are just waiting for everyone to get logged in and we're going to start here in just a few seconds. All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. So good morning, thank you for joining our webinar. I'm Jamie Montgomery, Office Specialist from Oregon Pacific Area Health Education Center. Today, I will be your host and your moderator. Okay, so we're just gonna go over a few housekeeping slides today. On your GoToWebinar control panel, you're going to notice that all microphones are muted. They will remain muted during this session. If you are experiencing audio difficulties, please make sure your computer, computer speaker volume is turned up or use the phone option to listen in. Over on the side, you will be able to find downloaded from the handouts option all the slides, and we can also email them to you within one week. Please use the question options for typing questions or comments at any time. Questions will be answered at the end. If we run out of time, we will answer your questions via email and we will email you the Q&A within one week. Also, very important, the activity code to obtain CME or CE credit for this activity, you must log in to www.eads.com and enter the activity code below, which is 58GEES. It is very important that you keep this code written down and that you obtain your certificate within seven days. After the seven days, the activity code does expire and you would need to contact our continuing medical education office with Cindy Koch to obtain certificate from the website. All right, and today we have the webinar with um, hosted agency of Samaritan Lebanon Community Hospital and Oregon Pacific Area Health Education Center presentation presented by Amy Weiser. I'm gonna go ahead and leave Amy Weiser to go ahead and introduce herself. Hi everyone and thank you, Jamie. So yeah, as Jamie said, I'm Amy Weiser. I am a family doctor. I live in Portland, Oregon. Um, and I'm now practicing at a community-based organization. I have a great deal of interest in HPV, um, as well as cervical cancer screening and prevention. Um, I am very active in the ASCCP. Um, these are the people who make the guidelines for management of when you have an abnormal uh, cervical cytology or pap smear. Um, I'm on the board of directors there, and I also, um, work with the American Cancer Society for their cervical cancer prevention initiative. Uh, and fingers crossed, we'll be also be able to be involved in cancer um, moonshot with the Biden administration. Um, so I am so excited to be able to work with AHEC today and share um, some uh, quality improvement best practices with you. So, um, Jamie, do you wanna allow me to share my screen? Um, yep, I uh, just got one disclosure. Um, so for everyone, Dr. Weiser and the planners of this activities report that we have no conflicts of interest or relevant financial relationships with any commercial entities that might affect the contents of this presentation. And with um, Dr. Weiser and planners of this activity also have no relevant financial relationships to disclose with ineligible companies whose primary business is producing, marketing, selling, reselling, or distributing healthcare products used by or on patients. And without further ado, I am going to turn the presenting over to Dr. Okay. 
Alrighty, so uh, you should be able to see my screen, and if not, I need you to uh, send Jamie a message. But I'm going to go ahead and start. Jamie, can you see it? Yes, I'm able to see it fine. Awesome, great. Okay, so um, today we're going to spend some time talking about quality improvement practices. And sometimes when you talk about QI, I kind of like silently groan to myself because it's an arduous task. It's something new for an already strained system, especially over the past two years. My God, it's been two years. Um, but since things are, you know, looking maybe on the upswing, we should be getting back to um, really making sure that we are covering all preventative health um, recommendations, and that includes HPV vaccination. Um, so I um, am a family doctor, as I said, I had worked rurally um, in Sublimity, Oregon, and then moved to Portland to join OHSU, lived an academic life, and I'm now working um, through Prism Health, which is part of the Cascade AIDS Project. So, oh, no, I can't change my screen. Oh, there we go. Okay. I have no financial uh, relationships or conflicts of interest to disclose. I'm going to say that part of the presentation is taking from the CDC, you are the key to cervical cancer prevention slide deck. And then content of the prevention or the presentation is also from the American Cancer Society Action Guide, um, which is entitled Steps for Increasing HPV Vaccination in Practice. And we'll talk about that. Okay. So in this hour, uh, we wanna cover a couple of things. First of all, we wanna review some evidence-based interventions or action strategies for um, improving our vaccination rate. And we're going to review some toolkits that are available um, and that make a lot of sense. It's kind of already mapped out. So it's more of a plug and play versus an invent it and then try it. Um, developing some self efficacy and delivering effective HPV vaccination recommendations. How do we speak to our patients? How do we speak to each other? And how can we get better at doing that? Um, and then modeling some resources that you could um, try to apply to your practice. And this is not a one size fits all because our practices are all different. Um, but you know, this is um, more of a community cooperative um, resource uh, sharing that may work for you. So I think it's important before we talk about QI um, of HPV to just spend some time talking about HPV and the epidemiology behind it. So, you know, this is something that really affects everybody. Most people are going to be infected with at least one type of HPV at some point in their lives. And currently, close to 80 million Americans are infected with it. There's about 14 million new infections per year. And this is just, we're just talking in the U.S. We're just talking domestically. Worldwide, there's a lot more because there's a lot more patients and people. Um, High-risk types of HPV cause majority of cancers that involve the anogenital tract. So we're talking um, the cervical, a vaginal, vulvar, anal, and penile cancers. But HPV high risk also is causative for oral pharyngeal cancers, and we know that these are on the rise and specifically due to HPV. Most commonly, people in their teens or their early 20s um, will be the ones affected, infected with HPV. And we think about that because this time of life is more closely associated with sexual debut, um, you know, sexual activity, HPV as an STI. We think about it a little bit differently than gonorrhea and chlamydia, but it really is an STI. And so we're thinking about sexual activity. The interesting thing is that though this is so prevalent, a lot of people are never going to know that they've been infected with HPV. So let's move on. And, and that's an important thing because if you're not, if you don't know that you're infected, um, it's really hard to stop transmission of it. Um, and we want to focus on, because this is so prevalent, how can we intervene as primary prevention before HPV is even on the horizon for someone? Um, globally, the World Health Organization is also um, planning strategy to accelerate the elimination of cervical cancer. So most um, patients will find out that they have HPV when they have an abnormal pap smear and they have a pre-cervical cancer diagnosis. So we really want to eliminate cancer, specifically of the cervix. Um, it is a pelvic health problem. 
And so trying to prevent HPV is a great strategy to decrease the incidence of cervical cancer. And so WHO has um, what they call the 90, 70, 90 targets by 2030. So eight years from now. So globally, 90% of girls are to be fully vaccinated by the age of 15. 70% of women are screened with a high performance test by 35 years of age, okay? And then 90% of women identified with cervical disease are gonna re receive treatment. And so this is WHO goals. I would hope that because um, this also covers care for low income countries, that us as a high income country could maybe do a little bit better, um, but we definitely have a lot of work to do. And so that gets to the meat of what we're gonna talk about today. So specifically for HPV vaccination, um, this is our preventative strategy prior to infection. And this chart demonstrates the HPV types that are targeted by, a, by each HPV vaccine. Back in the day, we had the bivalent, then the quadrivalent, and now we're working with the nonovalent, okay? So 6, 11, 16, and 18, which are the major high-risk players that are positive for cervical cancer, pre-cervical cancer changes. And then we have other high-risk um, types, which are also known to, um, to really play a role in the development of cervical cancer and other cancers as well. So we have the 6, 11, 16, and 18, and then we have five additional types in the non-avalent. Um, so for those with a cervix, uh, this is all very important. Um, we also know that those without a cervix are also affected with HPV. And so HPV vaccination is really for every human being. So when are we to get this vaccination? Well, it's recommended um, between the ages of nine and 26, but really ultimately we should be starting to talk with our patients and their families around the age of nine, maybe not start dosing at that time. We usually say between ages 11 and 12 um, is the time when the HPV vaccine is recommended. And it kind of makes sense because there's other vaccines that are indicated at that time. Um, this is typically a time when kids will come in um, for their annual exams. A lot of times for schools, um, you need to have your vaccines up to date um, around this, this age, around this time. So it kind of makes sense that we would say that on time is between the ages of 11 and 12. Later, maybe ages 13 and 14, but as we get after age 15, you'll note one thing is that our two dose series then turns into a three dose series. So it's one extra time to come back to the office to get another vaccination. So it's a little bit easier the younger that we start because there's only two doses. So everyone can get the vaccine. Um, I would like to say that, uh, you know, it, this chart goes up to age 26. But in 2018, the FDA expanded the approved age range um, for the nonovalent vaccine, which is really what we, this is the one that we all have in, in, the, in the clinic or in the office. I don't even know if you can get hold of the quadrivalent anymore. I think they've just phased that out. Um, but the nonovalent, the one that we're using currently, we can use it up through the age of 45 in both, um, in any gender. Um, so that was in 2018 when the FDA expanded the 9 to 26 range to 9 to 45. And then a year later in 2019, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices or the ACIP said, okay, well, for adults age 27 to 45, there is a public health benefit of HPV vaccine, um, but maybe it's minimal. And so approaching this with a shared clinical decision making um, uh, way is recommended because some persons who are not adequately vaccinated might benefit. Okay, so so what does this mean? This is kind of a vague catch-all, not very specific. That was in 2019. And then in 2020, the American Cancer Society said, you know, we're not supporting the ACIP because of low effectiveness, low cancer prevention, potential of a vaccine in this age group up to age four to five. 45, there's a burden of decision-making on patients and clinicians, you know, um, it's not very clear. It's a little bit muddy. Um, so it's basically use your clinical judgment 
have a conversation with your patient. Um, and there's going to be more to come on what really we should be considering for our shared decision making um, conversations as there aren't really firm recommendations. I am going to say that in 2020 as well, so two years ago, the ASCCP did come out with um, a statement. Um, they announced a call saying that those um, clinicians who are routinely exposed to the virus, so those doing colposcopy and the LEAP, um, or other surgeries should have an HPV vaccination because it is felt that our um, risk is greater than the general population. Um, and so we should be vaccinated. So I got my vaccine last year, um, about two years after my own child did. Um, but it is kind of it's, it is kind of cool to know that I am protected. So the vaccine itself, it is safe. Um, benefits far outweigh any potential risks. There's been lots of studies about safety um, for HPV, and these have all been reassuring. We know that the vaccine works. Um, it works because we have had some population studies um, early and mid outcomes have been studied. So, um, for example, impact studies are available from multiple countries. And in fact, there was a review of 65 studies in 14 high income countries. Um, and after about five to eight years of vaccination, they saw an HPV 16, 18 prevalence decrease by about 66%, which is statistically significant. Inogenital warts decreased by at least 54%. And cervical precancers also decreased um, in the population between 25 and 29 by over 30%. So this kind of moves from early outcomes to more of a mid um, outcome as far as length of study. Um, and we also know that there is evidence of heart effects, um, specifically with inogenital wart decrease incidence among those with a penis in countries where males were not part of the vaccination program. So there is a bit of herd immunity there. And we also know that the vaccine lasts. So studies are suggesting that vaccination protection against HPV is long lasting. Um, there's no evidence of any waning protection and multiple studies are underway to um, continue to, to uh, monitor this progress. We know that from the evidence that exists already, um, that protection lasts for at least 10 years, which is a fairly long time. Okay, despite all this that we know, um, we're not doing so great. We could definitely do better. So our HPV vaccination rates remain very low. Um, you can see in the outline, um, when we're talking about all adolescents on the left-hand side, we feel that through studies by the CDC that achievable vaccination rates are in the 90s, 94 percent, 93, 95%. But what are we actually doing? We're actually doing about 65% so in the mid-60s. Um, and globally, we know that low and middle-income countries, think back to that um, WHO slide, have achieved, have achieved higher rates of vaccination. So this reflects that it's not about the actual resources, but rather the delivery of the resources. So how can we improve? How can we do better? Um, let's look at some of the studies. So this is this. I realize that this is a wordy slide, um, but this reflects a, a publication that was um, published about six years ago in the journal Pediatrics. And what these authors wanted to do, they noted that other countries have considerably more success achieving these higher rates of HPV vaccination. So they wanted to gain insight from global efforts and they conducted a systemic review um, of the literature for national and international initiatives that were launched to improve HPV vaccination. So they actually took a look at about 51 articles um, that were published between 2006 um, when the vaccine came out um, to a year prior to publication of this. Um, they used a framework from the Community Preventative Service Task Force to guide data extraction and synthesis. And they identified that successful health interventions um, to provide a framework um, uh, to really assess the intervention's design and execution. So the effective strategies to improve the vaccination rates really fell into three categories. And these are informational, behavioral, and environmental. So there's no one best way. Um, really, this to me reflects that there is a multifaceted 
approach and that each practice will need to find out what works for them. So when we're talking about informational strategies, when we break these three groups down, we're talking about individualized as well as community-wide um, education campaigns. Um, and what was found was that improved vaccine uptake happened during the intervention, but there was no evidence to, to suggest that the effect was sustained. So for example, in 2006, manufacturer Gardasil Merck launched a campaign and if you, sadly, maybe you were one of my patients back at that time, uh, when I first started practice, you would hear me singing this jingle because it had a commercial and it was one less, and then it had print ad, and it really brought this vaccine to the forefront of teenage girls at that point in time. Um, there was a lot of outreach to providers to let us know that this was on the market and what this was all about. But because most of you probably have no idea what I'm talking about when I sang the little jingle, we know that it was not long lived, that informational strategies need to have persistent nurturing, right? You can't do it for three months and say, yep, we're done, check that off the list, this is going to work forever and ever. It needs to be uh, nurtured as we go on. Now, how can you do this? Well, you know, in the community, you can, um, you know, have educational um, sessions, you can print posters or handouts, uh, handouts off out in your office as well. That could be feasible. So again, making that information present and making it sustained in its presence. Um, environmental is another effective strategy. This can be um, examined and put into practice with school-based vaccination programs. You can increase access, reach a large and diverse population. Um, international government initiated programs like those that um, WHO is involved with. Um, this is more environmental. They have vaccination sites a lot similar to the COVID vaccination sites that we have. Um, so we could um, use this as an effective strategy. But the question that usually comes down is, geez, is this, is this feasible? Um, can you staff a school-based clinic? Can you partner with a community-based organization? You know, maybe some of us can, depending on where we practice, but maybe some of us can't. Um, and, and HPV, when we're talking about school-based, HPV is actually not a required vaccination for school entry um, in Oregon. Now, in other countries and in other states, it is. So 21 states plus DC, um, are requiring this, um, you know, in that usual time between sixth and seventh grade when kids come in for their, I need to get my shots before I can go to school. Um, there is a routine opt-out option, but those states are making this more normalized. Um, and so trying to make um, this vaccination rate increase when maybe socioeconomically um, kids are not in a high income population. The last kind of group of strategies is behavioral. Um, they found that there's a broad range of effectiveness to um, the studies or initiatives um, that displayed behavioral strategies. It required significant effort, um, and this led to inconsistent outcomes. So the bottom line is that concerted effort is required to optimize uptake of HPV vaccine. But really, when we're talking about the behavior, the behavior is ours, it's not our patients, it's the providers. And so what studies are really showing is that multi-pronged interventions targeting both the patient and the provider are what are going to increase our vaccination rate against HPV. So now, lucky for us, toolkits are available through the American Cancer Society, and this is how we can change our behaviors um, this toolkit was developed from the work of experts in the field. Um, actually, I have been able to um, work with many of these people and they are very passionate and very um, provider and patient centered. Um, it's very comprehensive. It's easy to follow. It's on the ACS website as well. So it is accessible. Okay, so this is the first page of the toolkit. And if you're looking at this and squinting your eyeballs, I am too, because it's really small. And if you're like taking a deep breath in and going, oh, oh my Jesus, like, does she not know what my life is every day? Um, I do. 
And we're going to break this down because I think that this is very overwhelming, but very comprehensive. So let's break it down because it's in four different steps. Okay, so step one, assemble a team. So really what can be most beneficial is to choose someone within your clinic who is very enthusiastic about HPV immunization. This person should possess the authority to implement practice changes, right? If they're going to be a team leader or a clinic champion, you need to give them some autonomy to actually follow through on the things, the ideas that they have, and they should be given some time to guide the initiative as well. Your clinic may already have a vaccination champion or a vaccination go-to, um, and so this could be already in their wheelhouse. Um, it does not have to be um, a back office person. It can be a front office person. Um, it could be an administrator, um, a clinical champion. Um, it can be a champion at each office. If you're in a larger system, it can be one person. But just to have somebody kind of your point person is really going to be beneficial. And form a quality improvement team. People who come up together, they meet regularly. They do PDSA processes. They review the rates. They set the benchmarks or the goals for your practice. And these are the people who can create and then update office policies. Um, and you can also identify external organizations and resources in your community that could be supportive. So ACS, um, American Academy of Pediatrics has lovely information. Your local AHEC offices, I have to plug them. The CDC has great information as well. Maybe there are county or city health officials, your local health department, um, as well as school clinics that you could team with. So a team can be, however it's gonna be functional for you, whatever resources you have. So if you're in a small rural community, you know, the practice where I was initially, we had nine people in the whole office, front office, back office providers, and that was us. And so, um, you know, you can do it with a small team. Uh, the university where I was has a huge team. Um, you just need that point person. Okay, so we can do that. Step one in the back. Make a plan. We want to identify opportunities to increase the vaccination for HPV. So, you know, it's kind of inventorying, well, where are we now at baseline? Like, what do we do now, right? What is our current vaccination process? What exists? And then, um, you know, things like when are vaccines given? What kind of office visits? What age? And then share the results with the staff. Make sure that everyone is, is taking a part in the plan. Um, a nice way to start out is to determine what your baseline vaccination rates are. So you can calculate the rates for patients who have received vaccination for each dose of HPV, Tdap, and meningococcal by the 13th birthday. Um, and this will help you improve the accuracy of your baseline rates, right? So identify your sources, whether you do chart audits, immunization registry, or EMR, determine a 12 month period for a baseline. Pre-COVID, so, you know, prior to 2020 might give you a better representation, but it might be very interesting as of now to compare what you had been versus where you are currently. Identify patients who have turned 13 during the measurement year um, and identify patients who have received vaccine for HPV, Tdap, and meningococcal, and then calculate rates. And what this can show you are many things. It can have you reflect on what your protocol is for data entry and verification to make sure that your records are accurate. Are we missing documentation? And then if you compare your rates for Tdap and meningococcal versus HPV, are those rates different, right? And so this lets you know where you are so that you can plan your PDSA. So what is your plan? Well, you're gonna have to design your clinic's vac vaccination strategy. Um, if you have done any quality improvements in the past and they've worked, use them. Absolutely recycle these. You know that they work for your population. Um, if you don't have a vaccination policy specifically for HPV, create one. And what schedule are you going to use? What's going to be best for your office? Incorporate staff feedback. So this is not only the administrators saying it, it's people on the ground. And it's not the providers as well. It's people giving the shots. So I don't actually give the immunizations because I'm a big baby. Um, and there are others who are more skilled and will cry less than I will. And so I need to talk to my MA. How do they feel about this? Get them involved with design and implementation. Whoever's gonna be the giver of the shot needs to be on board with this too. Um, you know, as far as the schedule, some offices are like, yep, age, age 11. Some are like age 12, some are age nine and get them, get them in. 
um, and then determine when the second dose is because there can be a range for this. We'll talk this a little bit later. Um, and assess and recommend HPV vaccination every opportunity. Um, making sure that you know that this is a cancer vaccine and minimizing these missed opportunities of immunizations. This kind of goes back to um, the beginning of this portion of the talk where we knew that, you know, opportunities are present so that 94% can get this immunization, but we really only seize the opportunity for about 60% of them. Okay, step three. See, we're on the third column already. Engage and prepare all staff. So what does this mean? It means it means that everybody needs to be on the same page. Um, you need to train everybody to make sure that there's a consistent positive message that's delivered to parents and humans, or, or parents, parents and patients. We want to use human interest stories to create staff involvement and investment. So feel free, you know, as I shared that I got my HPV series, you can share that with your office mates if you feel that that is something um, relationally that you can um, get behind. And, you know, we want to point out non-clinical staff because non-clinical staff could potentially impact vaccination rates if they share any misinformation um, with patients. You know, they're the ones who may answer the phone. And if, if somebody has a question, they need to be knowledgeable or at least know where our resource is. They need to understand the schedule of the dosing. So your front office needs to get those patients on the schedule for when to come back. Um, and they also need to understand insurance to decrease any barriers to vaccination. Now, insurance has come a long way over the years. And so insurance should not be as much as a barrier as, you know, maybe 10 years ago. But that can be on people's minds. Um, they want to make sure that this is a covered benefit. It should be. Um, and there's also, if they have no insurance, um, there are programs through the manufacturer of HPV who feels really strongly that this vaccine should be not in a fridge somewhere, but in somebody's body doing what it's supposed to do. Um, so that is how non-clinical staff can be involved. We want to prepare the clinic system as well. You can modify your, your EMR to accommodate the needs of your plan. Sorry about that. There's a misspelling there. We also want to make sure that we have enough vaccination supply and that we're storing it correctly as well. Um, the EMR can track each dose administered. You can train your staff on how to enter and extract data from it. Um, and you want to make sure that um, you're really making your EMR work for you, not you work hard for your EMR or whatever system you're doing. So keeping all staff on the same page, we really want to align the communication with the mission. You want to give the staff cancer prevention mission. HPV vaccination prevents cancer-causing infections and pre-cancers. Reinforce HPV vaccinations as the norm, right? Just like parents choose to vaccinate their child as infants, this is a normal vaccine to receive when you're a preteen. We should use clear, consistent messages. We should use the talking to parents handout. Look, it's already there. It's already accessible. You don't have to make anything up. Um, but just making sure that everyone is um, really communicating the same message. So again, engaging and preparing. We want to prepare the parent and the patient. And so you can provide educational materials. You can provide handouts. You know, we use vaccination for children handouts for most of our vaccination administration. And there's a great one for HPV. Are there any other handouts? Are there posters that you can put up? not only trigger your memory, but have your patients inquire about it. Um, and then preparing the clinicians. So how do we effectively communicate with parents and patients? Um, and there are uh, several education materials that provide really targeted um, for provider communication. So you're the key to HPV cancer prevention. There's CDC resources, lots of videos. There's CME, it's like this one, um, and there's other updates for staff. And so as we're talking, um, about, um, you know, getting your patients vaccinated by their 13th birthday, how do we effectively communicate? Well, we as providers or anyone in the office wants to make an effective recommendation. So we know that this vaccine is gender neutral. If you're a human being, you should receive this vaccine. Ages when we tend to start are between 9 and 12. And we want to commu communicate this recommendation the same way in the same day. And I'll get to that in a second. We want to ensure the clinicians know um, when somebody is due or overdue for, for this immunization. 
So this can be done by a team huddle, scrubbing the charts at the beginning of the clinic session, just kind of part of the routine. And it can be identified by MA, by front office, um, by the provider themselves um, to make sure that as we have a, a patient in the office, what can we do for their preventative health? Um, and there has been studies from um, published in the MMWR that if adolescents were given the HPV vaccine at visits where they received other vaccines, coverage would reach greater than 91% by age 13. Um, this was published in 2014, so kind of way in the beginning um, of when uh, HPV vaccination really came on the scene, and it's still true today. Um, this is from the National Immunization Survey. So we want to make sure that we bundle our recommendations for immunizations. So how do we do this? Well, again, bundling recommendations, ensuring consistent messaging, use every opportunity to vaccinate, effectively answer questions and provide personal examples if you feel comfortable. We know that there are reasons that parents may not uh, initiate HPV vaccination for their children. Um, but inter interestingly, not recommended is one of the top reasons. And this means that we, the provider, is not giving a recommendation for this vaccination. Um, and that strong, strong recommendations from us providers is the single best predictor of vaccination for any vaccine. If we don't tell our patients that they are due for a vaccine, this is good for their health, they need to consider pursuing this, they will not know because they do not have telepathic skills, right? So remember that, um, you know, parents themselves may have been older than the age of 26 when this vaccination came on the market, right? Um, they might not know it even exists. You know, if I wasn't in medicine, I, I have no idea if I would know that this exists or not. Um, because if they never got it or learned about it, how can we anticipate that they would know that they need to give it to their kid, right? So making sure that we are very transparent with vaccinations that are needed um, and that we voice and advocate for preventative medicine is very important. Um, we, on the other hand, we underestimate the value that parents place on HPV vaccination. So the left-hand bars is the value that parents give to vaccines, and then on the right hand, it's the clinician's estimate. And grossly underestimated is the value that placed on HPV vaccine from our perspective for what the parents um, for what the parents feel. Um, there's a huge disconnect between parents and clinicians, um, and especially you know you can compare this to pertussis. You can compare this to meningitis. Um, and Menactra or meningococcal vaccine is given at the same time and the same age as HPV. So why on earth would meningitis be much more valued than HPV? Why wouldn't it be equal? So we have a lot of learning to do and a lot of misconceptions to clear up. So the perceived as well as the real consent of parents influence how um, we recommend the HPV vaccine. So I mentioned bundled, bundled recommendations, and I mentioned the same way on the same day. So we can group adolescent vaccines. We can recommend HPV vaccine, vaccination in the same way that you recommend the Tdap and the menstrual cockle vaccine. And you can recommend it today. So the same way and the same day, it's really in the same sentence. Um, you can say your child is due for Tdap, HPV, and meningeal cockle vaccines today, right? So we kind of sandwich HPV in the middle so that it's not like an afterthought. Um, we want to make sure that we are approaching this um, with, with equity for all of these vaccines. Um, now, some parents, as well as some patients, may be interested in vaccinating, but still have lots of questions. Interpret a question as a need of additional reassurance from you, the clinician that they trust um, with their child's health care. And ask parents about their main concern. Be sure that you're addressing their real concern. You know, are they concerned that this is going to be the gateway to sexual activity, right? Really get down to the meat of the matter to make sure that everyone's on the same page and you can provide reassurance. 
So a lot of common questions are, well, why does my kid need HPV vaccine? And you can share that HPV vaccination is important because it prevents cancer, which absolutely it does. And that's why I'm recommending that your child start the series today. What cancers are caused by HPV? Another common question. We know that persistent infection of HPV can cause cancer in the cervix, vagina, and vulva in those who have them, as well as cancer of the penis in those who have that organ, and can cause cancer in the anus, we all have that, and the throat. Um, so it's a wide ranging for the effect in any, in any gender construct. So we can help prevent infection with the HPV types that cause these cancers by starting the HPV vaccine series today. Remember, this is primary prevention. Is my kid really at risk for HPV? Well, yeah. Um, you know, 80 million people <laughs> have, had this, have had this infection. Uh, you know, 14 million people have it currently. Yeah, it's really common. Um, it affects everyone. We can protect your child from the cancers and the diseases caused by the virus by starting the vaccination today. How long can we wait? Now, this is a common one. Oh my God, can we wait? We're just not ready for this. So the two dose schedule is recommended if this series is started before age 15. You know, but man, I don't recommend waiting to give this cancer preventing vaccine at a later age. You know, older teens they have busier schedules, more sports, they're all over the place. It becomes more difficult to not only schedule an appointment that works, but to get them to show up. So it's best to start today so your kid is protected as soon as possible. And you only need to come back once for a booster versus twice. Uh, another one, we only want the vaccines needed for school. And a way to discuss this is to say, you know, school entry requirements don't always reflect the current recommendations to keep your child healthy. And that's very true. HPV vaccine, along with other adolescent vaccines, will prove or will provide your child with the best protection, right? Um, and then another one, would you give HPV vaccination to your kids? Um, answer this as you feel comfortable. Um, I, I'm very upfront with this. Yes, I have given HPV vaccine to my child. I strongly believe in the importance of this vaccine. I've taken it myself. Also, if you don't want to share personal stories, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the um, American Academy of Family Physicians, NIH, Cancer Centers, and CDC, they all agree that HPV vaccination is very important for your child as well as safe. So what happens if after all these questions, uh, you know, we're still unsure, we're not ready to do it today? Well, you know, declining it, this is not final. Conversation can be revisited. You can give them extra information. You can have a follow-up conversation. But what you should do is end the conversation, the, the in the moment conversation, with at least one action that you both agree on. So for some of these common questions and the answers, I did take them to from the How I Recommend Vaccination video series that was produced by the CDC. Um, and it's really great. Um, I'm not gonna make anybody role play today because that is not how this webinar works, um, but there are some great examples um, of how to um, make sure that you're communicating on the level of health literacy that your patient is at and their family is at. Um, while getting um, all the information across. Okay, so we're back to the toolkit. We're gonna circle back here. Step four, get your patients vaccinated by the 13th birthday. All right, so how do we, how do, we do this? Well, you know, one way to do it is standing orders. So um, whenever a patient comes in the office, it doesn't matter what visit type they're in, acute, scheduled while visit, anything in between, um, you know, have a standing order so that you can look at the chart, see what they're due for and say, hey, you're due for this vaccine, let's give it to you today. You can provide walk-in appointments or immunization only appointments as well at your clinic. Um, remind parents when it's time for the next dose of vaccine or when the vaccine is overdue. So making sure that we're not only initiating the series for HPV, but making sure we complete it. And so getting that follow-up schedule. So this is the big question, when do we need to come back? Well, if your kid is less than 15, they need a second shot in six months. Or since your child is already 15, they're going to need a second shot in one to two months, and then their third and final shot six months from today. Also important, when you check out, make sure to make an appointment for that second dose and the third shot. And put that appointment on your calendar before you leave today. You know, for many of us, 
if the appointment or the meeting doesn't go onto our Outlook calendar or our Google calendar or whatever we're using, we would have no idea. We're flying blind here, people. They're like, if Outlook goes down, I have no idea what I'm doing during the day. We really rely on that te technology. So let's use it to our advantage. Everyone has a smartphone. Put it in the smartphone. Um, it, the kids can put it in a smartphone too. Most people who are age 11 and 12 have some sort of electronic device. So not only can it be a parental responsibility, we can also really encourage the younger patients to become part of their own health stewardship um, and really enable them to be thoughtful about their health care. Reminders and recalls. Um, some offices do this, some don't. Um, it can indeed improve your immunization rates and overall health care delivery and combat the immunization information gap. So. Um, chart reminders, you can display them prominently, whether it's EMR or paper charts for all health team members. Um, it reaches patients who are in the office. Um, so if you haven't come into the office for a minute, it's not going to help, but it does work to decrease missed opportunities when patients are in the office. So check every visit type um, and check every visit. Standing orders, um, this would apply to all visit types. A lot of offices have standing orders for um, flu vaccinations. So this could be something that you could expand your policy to, working that HPV champion to allow some autonomy and having buy-in from the team, especially those giving the immunizations. Um, mailers and phone reminders, you know, some offices do this, your mammograms do, your colonoscopies do. Um, you can also do this for HPV vaccination or any vaccination. It can be automated. If not, it's gonna be pretty time intensive depending on how big your practice is. Um, and it's not gonna get your patients into the office. They will need to take that next step and schedule a visit. You know, and what works for one practice may not work for another. I remember we tried this in my rural setting and it, it just kind of crashed and burned. We got like two people um, to call and schedule an appointment. So we found out that this is not a viable option um, for, for the cost and for the time that it took, that we needed to approach this in a different manner to really get the numbers um, that we wanted to, to improve our rate. So this was part of our PDSA. And so we changed our approach. Um, and so that brings us to really measuring and improving your performance. If you're gonna make these interventions, if you're gonna use some of the tips from the toolkit, you wanna make sure that you're studying um, to say, what is the effect of the changes that we've made? Are these good? Um, should, should we bail on this? Should we try something else? You wanna measure the number of missed opportunities um, to really um, shed light on what is actually happening. Um, you can share these with, within your office. Um, we had dashboards that we would say, these are our rates. And so individuals or teams, if you're on teams, can kind of have that competitive spirit with a great thing too, you know, hey, we want to be the people who have the most immunizations for our patients and the least number of missed opportunities. Um, so it's important that providers know their individual rates as well. And this is a lovely way to motivate. So what can we do? Well, we can do a lot of things because we can do better and we need to do better. So I always say, you don't know what you don't know, right? You have to take a reflection. You have to take a look and do some investigation. Trend your rates. Um, see what works for your community, what doesn't work for your practice, and continue to have the overall goal of improving HPV vaccination, vaccination rates in your community. You want to stay up to date. Um, there's multiple education products available free through the CDC website. There's immunization courses, there's net conferences, there's You Call the Shots, self-study modules. Um, there's a lot of resources available and it's something that you can do at a lunchtime clinic meeting um, with your teammates um, or even five minute examples um, or to read through a pamphlet um, will work not only for patients, but also for providers and teams. So these are the references that we included today. And I'm gonna see if I can stop sharing um, my screen. Actually, uh, Jamie, what do you want me to do? Do you want me? Okay, thank you.
cool. So if All anybody right. has any questions, I'm happy to um, chat. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Weiser. All right, does if anybody has any questions, the question panel is now open and you are more than welcome to type in your question and we can get some answers from Dr. Weiser. So far, I don't have any questions. Well, I definitely threw a lot of information <laughs> out in a quick period of time, which I may possibly be known for doing um, because I get very excited. As you can tell, I'm very enthusiastic about HPV and HPV prevention. Um, if anybody has any questions, kind of, you know, like you're eating your lunch and kind of thinking about stuff, feel free to send an email um, to Jamie and she'll forward it to me. Uh, always, um, always interested in helping to um, improve the vaccination rates in our community of Oregon. Awesome. And then I will, if any questions do come through, I will make sure that the question answers get sent over, like Amy Weiser said to her office. We can get those questions and answers sent back to you within a week. Also to let you know, there's going to be a survey at the end um, of the webinar. The survey is actually going to be where you log in at the eads.com website to obtain your certificate. Again, please make sure that if you have any questions, you can email me here at jmontgomer at semhealth.org. There is going to be a recording of the webinar today at our website, www.opahec.org forward slash webinars dash one. If you would like to download the slides, they are in the handout section of the module. And finally, to make sure that you please don't forget to get your certificate from the eads.com website. Again, the activity code is 58 G E E S, 58 G's. You need to do that within seven days or the code will expire. That's for CME and CE credit. Um, this activity code for today's webinar, please write it down. Um, but if for some reason you have any trouble getting your certificate, please reach out to me. Again, that's Jay Montgomery at sunhealth.org. At this point, you have now completed the webinar and you may disconnect and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Jamie.